שלום לכם ותודה שאתם איתנו, חוצה ישראל בחינוכית. האורח שלנו היום הוא מורטון מנדל, אחד העשירים שביהודי ארצות הברית ואחד המיוחדים בהם, כפי שאני מקווה שתברכו בדקות הקרובות. מנדל הקים עסק משפחתי של חלקי חילוף למכוניות עם שני אחיו בשנת 1940 בהשקעה של 900 דולר. כעבור שנים הוא מכר את החברה בשלושה מיליארד דולר. גם בארץ יש לו השקעות והחזקות רבות, והתרומות שלו כאן בארץ במשך השנים מוערכות ב-400 מיליון דולר, מתוך כמיליארד דולר שהוא תרם בעולם כולו. אלה מספרים מרשימים מאוד, הנה עוד מספר מרשים. מנדל יחגוג השנה 94. יום העבודה שלו עדיין מתחיל ב-5 בבוקר, הוא עדיין יורד לפרטים הכי קטנים בניהול, והוא מוכן גם לחלוק את סוד חייו הארוכים איתנו, אני מקווה. Hello, Mr. Mandel. It's great to have you on our show. Thank you. Uh, do you still count your visitings in Israel? Do you know how many times you have been here? I, I really don't. It's probably getting close to 200. 200? Probably. So you come twice, three... Uh, I come th uh, now three to four times a year. If I understand correctly, you um, discovered, so to speak, Israel uh, relatively late in your life. I did. Uh, it was in 1967. Do you want to know why? Yes. Six-day war. Of course. Uh, and I, I, I was active in Jewish life as a volunteer in, in America, in Cleveland and nationally. But I had never been to Israel. And I was very active in the Cleveland volunteer community. And the Jews are a minority in Cleveland. Anti-Semitism was very strong when I was young. And in even, Cleveland? In Cleveland. And even by, in 1967, I was already 50. And it was diminishing, but still there were Jews who couldn't get into certain clubs in 1967. And there were companies that didn't hire Jews in 1967. That's largely changed now, but this is 2015. I was one of the few Jewish leaders who mixed pretty well with the general community. Mm -hmm. And my non-Jewish friends came up to me and said, Mort, how did you guys do that in six days? And I said, you guys, they're associating me with the Israelis. I kid you not, this is a serious statement I'm going to make. I was one foot taller in the city of Cleveland after the Six Day War. This is June. <clears throat> I went home. And after a few days, and I said to my wife, I don't believe this. We've got to get over there. In August, I was in Israel with my wife for the first time. Can you analyze, looking back at that point in your life, can you analyze what happened to you internally? I understand what happened to you with, with your friends, with the general okay. community, but what happened internally? I'll tell you what happened to me internally. My parents and my, the rest of my family were born in a shtetl in Poland came over to the United States right after World War I. I was born in 1921, the only one born in my family in America. And I grew up from the time I was maybe six or seven years old with serious, not life-threatening, but serious anti-Semitism. My father had a retail, small retail store in a Polish neighborhood where there were Polish Catholics, Polish, and I was a kike. And People didn't like me, and I was pretty good at fist fighting when I was six or seven or eight years old. And so I grew up with anti-Semitism. It, it was a big reality for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I got older, I remember I was president of my company in my 30s, and I was proposed as a member of, a, of something called the Young Presidents Club. And I, was, I had, a, I think, a very strong uh, uh, CV, uh, background that uh -huh. was uh, uh -huh. who was this guy Mort Mandel application and my non-Jewish friends who proposed me said there's no way they can turn you down Mort there are no Jews in this chapter 
we want you, we are proposing, this was a very nice thing, we're proposing you because you're Jewish. Mm. And <clears throat> we know there's no way they can turn you down. They turned me down, they rejected me. I come over to Israel, I'm gonna answer your question. Yeah. I came over to Israel and I, I saw Jews. I mean, I saw non-Jews, but I saw Jews and I saw people dressed with a shrimmel and you know, a very uh, uh, religious, uh, traditional clothes. And I said, my God, here they can walk on the street. Anybody can walk on the street here and not fear anti-Semitism. Maybe there are other kinds of problems, but not anti-Semitism. Uh, and it was, just, it was just a strong connection with me. And I said, I've got to learn more about Israel. I never dreamed I would be as active as I am in Israel. But at that time, there was just something like this that happened but to me. In my opening remarks, I quoted some, some sources um, saying that uh, you probably have donated, not invested, that's another figure, but you probably uh, all along the years donated in Israel some $400 million. Is it correct? Is the number it's, correct? I don't know about the exact number, mm -hmm. but yes. That's amazing. Now, I know that until quite recently, you didn't want your name on the things. You didn't want your name on buildings. You didn't want your name on institutions. And I understand that that slightly changed recently. Yeah, it's changed because in addition to uh, investing in people, which is our central thrust, I want to change the world. Specifically, I also want to change Israel. And the way we're doing it is by investing in people who have the desire, the ability, the passion to change the world. They want to change the world. We're helping them change the world. We now have, from our program, which deals with this, almost 380, I think, highly qualified world changer type people, and they are changing Israel. But, but I realize that there are other ways to help Israel. Uh, we've donated a lot of money to, to the Israel Museum, for example, to universities. Uh, and sometimes we build a building because they need the building, not because we want our name on the building, but we end up with our name on the building. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it works. If we are talking about people, can we talk about the principle of parking? Yeah. Can you tell me about it? Uh, I really think it's a Mort Mandel invention. Yes, I guess, uh, I guess so. <clears throat> what happened was that uh, my brothers and I started a company, uh, I guess measured against the whole world, we were pretty successful, and we kept expanding. <clears throat> and we learned early on something that maybe other people always knew, I don't know, but we learned early on that the key to our growth was not strategy, it was people that you needed strategy. You needed to have plans, but you really need people to execute them. All right. And <clears throat> I know that doesn't sound very profound, but uh, uh, it became pretty clear to us that the strongest asset we could have in our, in our, in our environment were very high quality people. So I think, uh, I'm, I'm guessing at, at how this came about, but I think I met somebody I was very impressed with. And I said to some of my colleagues, gee, I've met this guy, Kobe. Uh, <laughs> we don't have a job. Uh, it's such a pity. I wish we had a job for this guy because he really knows how to interview people, which I'm trying to make a joke. <laughs> and we said, well, why don't we hire him? Let's hire him. Well, what's he going to do? We'll find something. <clears throat> We started the theory of parking with our fingers crossed, mm -hmm. not being sure it would work. So you park the guy so in So we your... hire Kobe. Yes. And we say, Kobe says, what are we gonna do? We say, Kobe, come join us. We'll find the right spot for you. Our, uh, what we do is- In due we, time. Yeah, in time. And in the meantime, you'll do something that'll earn your salary. What I'm trying to check with you is, you cannot get as rich and as successful as you and your company and your family got without having the killer instinct, with, without being what we call here a shark. Do you have it? Do you have the killer instinct? Absolutely not. 
And nor do I agree with you. Okay. Look, there are more ways to do things than one way. Uh, actually, I'm going to use a Yiddish word, Ooh. menschkeit. That's very important to me. And if you talk to our leaders, whether it's in our businesses or in our foundation, they'll tell you how important culture is to me. I like good manners. I like courtesy. I like honesty. I like integrity. I like kindness. I like respect. I like generosity. That's as important to me as competence. In fact, without competence, they're finished. Without the other things, they're finished. Also. And does it work? And I don't have the shark instinct, nor do I agree that it's a fundamental uh, theory, an asset, which if you don't have it, you can't succeed. I don't believe that at all. This is what? It's a Bobe mindset. It's a Bobe mindset? Yes. It might, well, look, it might be the general conclusion. It's just not mine. Uh, going back to your relationships with, the, with the Israel and the Israeli economy, for many years you didn't invest here, right? Right. You donated, but you didn't want to I, invest. Absolutely. Can you explain yes. why you did that? Yes, because I, I, I identified Israel as a place where I should express my... Uh, my concerns about quality of life, about doing things that would lead to a better quality of life for everybody in this country, and I mean everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't want to mix business, making money. I didn't want to come over here to make money. Yeah. I decided to invest in business for a different reason, to create jobs. I decided one way I could help Israel, because that's a skill set I guess I have, was to buy failing businesses that were going to fail and lose, everybody lose their job and fix them up. And, and that, not selling them afterwards. And not selling them not afterwards. Selling, not exiting. No, sir. And that would be another way of helping this country. As I got more into what this country needs, I said, maybe I can move into the other sector and strengthen Israel another way by creating jobs where people are properly treated and people are properly paid. And I will tell you, when I walk through our glass-making plant in Yerucham, Phoenicia. Phoenicia, I get hugs. I get hugs from the union steward. I get hugs from people on the, on, on the line because they know I am trying to create a better life for them, not just make money. Now, if you don't make money, you fail. So I have to make money. Yeah, and you do. Um, and I understand that the story uh, with Phoenicia began with you going to the toilet there. Well, you're giving away one of my secrets. <laughs> uh, what I do when I visit a plant is I take a tour always. I'm thinking about buying it. Mm -hmm. I take a tour. And I find myself usually, not usually, always, in the manufacturing area where there's a lot of workers. And either the owner or his representative is taking me on a tour, and I say, you know what, I have to go to the toilet. He said, okay, come on, I'll take it. I said, no. Where's the closest toilet? I it said, wasn't well, prepared for the visit. For the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's it? And he said, well, I'll take it. And I said, no, this is where I want to go. I go in, and I look at it. Now, this is not exactly a science. If it's filthy or dirty, I know I'm going to buy this company. If it's just run down, I say, then I have to learn more. If it's sharp, I say, whoops, I have to be very careful. Because when a toilet is dirty, I jump to a conclusion. That's not a conclusion. That's not it's, a scientific conclusion. No, it's a piece of evidence. Yeah, all right. And I'm usually right. That's nice. And the toilet in Phoenicia was dirty. <laughs> it's clean now. Clean now. Clean now, very clean now. Um, in your book, you go back to the figure, to the very important figure of your mother. Yeah. In what way do you think that the way you live is uh, influenced until now yeah. by growing up with her? My mother and father <clears throat> were role models for our, their children. Uh, well, when I was growing up, I never thought of my parents, my mother, as a role model. She was my mother. She did my laundry, she cooked food, she occasionally took me someplace. 
<clears throat> and it was only when I got a lot older that I realized our parents, when I was more or less educated, our parents stood for the best in Western civilization. Decency, respect, honesty, integrity. On my street was a mixed street, Jews and non-Jews. Mostly, I would say one-third Jewish and two-thirds non-Jewish. People would come to my mother, Rosemary. Everybody was poor. Nobody had a car on that street. We were poor in the sense, we never used the word poor at home. I never thought of myself as poor, but uh, when we were never hungry, but I never had money for toys, and it didn't bother me. I had a wonderful childhood, but I, I, you know, we were in the lower economic strata. People would come to my mother, and this is in the 30s, All right. 19, this is in the, what is, was the Great Depression in America, and to say, Mrs. Mandel, I'd like to borrow $20. My daughter is getting married, and I need to buy a dress. $20 then, I think, could buy a dress. And my mother always said the same thing. Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Geschmarnowitz, whatever. Take it. I'm not going to lend it to you. Take it. You'll find a way to pay me back. Six, seven times a year. I didn't count it. It's only when I thought about it, looking back, five, six times a year. Five dollars. My mother was the go-to person on our street. And it wasn't until I was much older. I'm going to get emotional if I'm not careful. <laughs> it wasn't until I was much older that I realized where that money came from. My mother didn't buy herself a pair of shoes. She didn't buy herself a dress. That's where it came from. And that has such an impact on us. To this day, my brothers and I, now one of my brothers is gone, one of my other, my other brothers is not doing well. We used to sit around a table and we would say, you know, Ma wouldn't like that. Now, I can't explain to you why we said that. I think to this day I'm trying to please my mother. And it's just been a wonderful uh, envelope for me to live inside of, to have that sense of not just respect, but admiration for my parents. See, now I'm getting emotional. Yeah. Uh, we'll take a short break right now, okay. and we'll soon come back. Miad okay. Nashuv. שוב שלום לכם ותודה שאתם איתנו, אנחנו בחוצה ישראל בחינוכית עם מורטו מנדל, מגדולי המשקיעים והתורמים בישראל בעשרות השנים האחרונות. מיסטר מנדל, we were talking about your family and you mentioned your brothers. Yes. Uh, I think one of the most frequent questions you're being asked all along the years, the how do you manage? How do you manage to have a, a, a family business and not fighting after five minutes and disconnecting from each other for the rest of your life. Yes. How does it happen? What's the secret there? Uh, I still haven't figured that out, <laughs> but it happened, just as you described. Uh, look, uh, over the years, in philanthropy and in business, we did everything together. Over the years, my two brothers were my two best friends. No fights, no... No, just, wait, no. wait, I'll come oh. back to that. <laughs> and the same thing would be true about them. Now, having answered your question, yes. let me give you a little uh, color. <laughs> okay. We fought like cats and dogs, but we, it, it never affected our relationship. Uh, we didn't fight like cats and dogs every day, but we did have serious disagreements. And we had a rule. It can never be two against one. It has to be all three. So sometimes my brother Joe and I wanted to do something and Jack killed it. And we said, okay. Sometimes Joe vetoed. Sometimes I vetoed. I think one of the reasons we held together all these years is because if there were not three out of three yeses, it didn't happen. That was frustrating. Yeah. I but it, so. it, it so net, the, net. Two, the two cannot mandate no. what they want to do, but, but what about the feelings? What about the frustration? What about the... Human, natural, yeah. angry, yeah. upset. Yeah. Two days, three days. But we, it never got to where it, it affected 
the bond. The bond was there. I think that's my parents. Again. I don't know if I really understand the answer to your question. I don't know about inside, in my head, but that's what I think. <clears throat> and uh, we had one other thing that maybe was a factor. I'm not sure. I'm not sure this was good. I think it was good, but net, 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 perhaps not. We had no, we had a no nepotism rule. There were no children, no son-in-laws, no nothing. No, no other family members. No other family in the business whatsoever. That's we also put that rule in. Even when our, you got very, very, very yeah, big. Yeah, well, we had 8,000 people. We had the same thing with our top executives. The president of our company, after I was chairman, I was the original president. When I became chairman, the president of our company had a son who was a genius. He said, you want to hire Bobby? I said, I want to hire Bobby badly, but we don't hire children of our executives. So we cheated ourselves, in a way, out of a lot of talent. But you know what? We held our business together. That's fascinating. We, but yeah. If you mentioned your family and your sons, right. are they in business now? My, um, <clears throat> do you have the, the, the Bill Gates law? Like, like they have to, to, to do it themselves? Yes. You do? It's not the Bill Gates law, it's the Mort Mandel law. <laughs> but I'm older than he is. So, <laughs> I apologize. Well, yeah, yeah that's, that's right. Let's be careful. All right. But uh, yeah, my son Tom is in business on his own. He's in a radio business. My, uh, my other two kids are, children, are do women, and they're, they're raising. They never became professional. They were just normal, typical parents raising children. But what is it considered to be Bill Gates, wrongly considered what's to the, be? What's the Bill Gates law? He doesn't, he doesn't give money to his children or just, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he gives it back to the community and they have to build themselves from, from, from scratch. No, I, I give money to my... We, my brothers and I all were very generous and established f funds for our children. We sh we, 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 that we did. We're human. We're not, uh, you know, <laughs> that we did. Yeah, because... You grew up in a poor family. You didn't feel like, right. but you, it My was a poor family. My children grew up in a rich family. So how do you, how do you, how do you make them mensch? Example, not speeches. I think you lead by who you are and how you, and what you stand for. Well, I think what they heard from their parents, my kids heard from their parents at the dinner table and in the car when we were talking and around. I'd like to think my wife, I can tell you for my, about my wife for sure, she is a real mensch. As a matter of fact, she's in Israel right now. She's uh, an a, a, a honorary chairman of the board of Hebrew University, and she's very active in Hebrew University and, and so on. <clears throat> But she is a mensch. I'd like to think I am. You know, that's debatable. <laughs> so, right. So uh, my children grew up hearing the conversation around the house, and that's the greatest gift we gave them, not money. Just, I think we're, we are still, all my children are alive, my wife and I are alive. I think we are, I know this is a little self-serving, but I, I, I think we are good role models. Now, you mentioned your brothers. You yourself, I think this is the other most frequent asked question because it is really fascinating and optimistic to see you in your age, being yourself, being sharp as, as a razor. Uh, and, and you mentioned your brother, your, your old brother, not doing well but still alive. And is there a secret there? Because this is not genes. Your parents died relatively young. Yes. So it's not genes. Well, it, no, it might be genes. Yeah, it might be. It might be genes. Yeah, it might be. You know, just go back But five, that's, six generations. But that's less interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, right. You know, I don't know the answer to your question. I think, uh, you know, I think, quote, I live right, end quote. I'm careful. I have a personal trainer. Uh, I'm careful what I eat. I get a lot of sleep. I, I, you know, I, I think that makes a difference. I'll tell you something. You know what I believe? And maybe it's just an example of one. Working, I think, is very important to my mental, uh, whatever it is, mental ability, mental condition. I feel as good today as I did 
ever in my, in fact, I'm better today. This is a terrible statement, I suppose. Maybe you ought to cut it from your recording. Maybe we won't. Yeah. I'm at my best right now. And I know how old I am. And I say, boy, you're kidding yourself. I honestly mean it. I don't have to be correct, but I mean it. I'm at my best right now. And may you all will be. Malta Mandela, thank you very much for this conversation. It's been an honor. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much for your support.